So we're really excited to have, speaking of our developer experience team, one of our members, uh, Keenan Barrett, uh, will be joining us together with Brian Oliver, and they will be talking about, hello. Hi, Brian. I've heard so much about you, and it's really nice to meet you in person. Nice to meet you as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is the new in person. Um, so yes, I'm very excited that you'll be talking about GitOps and Flux scale to hundreds of developers, which scale has come up many, many times. Uh, and so I'm glad that you're here to share your story. Take it away. Super. Thanks for the great introduction. Yeah, this is our um, GitOps and Flux scale to 100s of developers talk. I'm Kingdon. Um, Brian, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, I'm Brian Oliver. Um, I love everything cloud and DevOps. Um, I don't have two jobs. I'm currently in transition from my role as the head of cloud engineering at Primerica over to uh, principal architect at ThoughtWorks. Uh, I'm an avid Flux user and uh, I'm all over codes on the internet. Great, thank you. And I, uh, just a little bit about myself, if you don't know me by now, I'm Kingdon. I'm a Flux maintainer. I'm that cow on the internet. Uh, you can tweet at me or find me on the Kubernetes or CNCF Slack pretty much every day, as well as the Weaveworks community Slack. Um, and here's our agenda for the talk today. Uh, so we're going to move pretty quickly through the intro to GitOps and Flux. And uh, Brian is going to present some uh, different patterns, some enterprise GitOps requirements. Uh, an image layer reconciler, and we'll see that as we get to it, uh, there will be a demo. Actually, there's two demos, I think, so. All right, so it's GitOps days, day two. Uh, we're nearing the end. Uh, there's a high probability that you already know what GitOps is, or at least you may have a decently solid idea of that. So I'm going to provide a reference to the formal definition for those of you that don't, or maybe who got the wrong idea from wherever you heard about GitOps first. Uh, so what is GitOps? Let's start with the single source of truth. Uh, the concept of, uh, in Git, we want our, uh, Git is our single source of truth uh, in GitOps. So uh, that's where we'll keep the desired state of our Kubernetes system that we'll configure using declarative artifacts. So what exactly is GitOps? Uh, well, GitOps exactly is a set of principles. And these are uh, not Weaveworks principles of GitOps. This is a vendor neutral working group, the GitOps working group that was started by Weaveworks, Azure, Red Hat, AWS, uh, GitHub, and CodeFresh. The list of vendors involved in the conversation does continue to expand. Uh, we welcome you. So GitOps working group is a time scoped working group and open GitOps is the permanent product. Um, since we think that GitOps can sort of be defined and then the work will be done uh, so the working group can close. So you put your Kubernetes manifests into the Git repository, and those are declarative artifacts. Okay, so that's at least 50% of GitOps right there. If you had the idea already of putting your YAML in Git and keeping your YAML in Git, rather than writing them from scratch again every time or generating them, then you're already well on your way. So I'll draw your attention to points three and four, which is uh, how GitOps differs from probably what a lot of people thought of doing next. Um, GitOps, as defined here, requires an agent of some kind, we'll say Flux, running inside of the target cluster. That agent's function is to pull changes into the cluster, um, and once it's committed and pushed in the main branch, there is no further gating or approval. So uh, we'll always see that the desired state of our cluster is going to be represented by the main branch of a Git repository, and we'll see that main branch is used uh, for all environments in a multi-cluster configuration and also uh, reconciling continuously. Uh, this is just as in Kubernetes itself. So these resources are declarative, so everything is idempotent. So reconciliation enforces the de desired state. Uh, changes are auditable and clearly communicated within this model. So remember, not Weaveworks principles of GitOps, vendor neutral. Uh, if it seems like too much, I'm not here to gatekeep or exclude impure GitOps implementations. Uh, all the principles are roughly equally important and, and you can start where you need to. This is going to be a unique story for everyone. Um, so the solution that we're demoing here today, uh, we hope embodies all of these ideas. Um, so maybe you're already on the path and, and if you're using Kubernetes, then you're already using declarative artifacts. Um, I think this is the first principle because it's the principle that makes uh, this whole thing possible. I don't uh, think that Kubernetes is mentioned in the definition though, so just be aware it helps 
Flux requires Kubernetes, uh, but GitOps itself does not. And uh, um, you can find out more at the GitOps Working Group website. Uh, so anyway, there's no mandate that you follow all of these principles. We don't require you to give up your cluster admin privileges, um, but we do recommend that you keep them for uh, break glass scenarios and try to use GitOps instead um, in a closed loop. Um, okay, so that's our concrete list of principles and what we're talking about. Um, generally speaking, you can start where you want and um, start towards the city on a hill. GitOps is our city on a hill, so here's time for a diagram. And we're going to move quickly through this diagram as it changes a couple of times. So ignore any flaws that you see here. Uh, we're going to keep the pace quick and head to that city on a hill. Uh, the circular arrows represent uh, agent reconciling and that heptagon steering wheel, of course, is Kubernetes. So as we update Git with new versions of our infrastructure, the reconciling agent will pull them into Kubernetes for us continuously every few seconds or minutes. And it was woefully oversimplified, of course. So let's make it a bit more accurate. Uh, not totally clear maybe what the robot is doing in the picture. He's taking a selfie. That's the best emoji combination I could come up with uh, for taking container images and doing what we do with them. Um, so I'm talking about image update automation here. Um, let's draw a box around this to remind us that this is all something that happens inside of Kubernetes. And uh, we also said it was pull based. So we'll move this guy into the cluster space there. And uh, CI is nominally responsible now for uh, building and releasing images to that package box icon, um, which represents the container registry where our new images are published as they're being produced. And also the two arrows representing the additional idea that we're monitoring an image repository for updates uh, besides the original point we already mentioned and hopefully understood that all of our Kubernetes YAML comes from Git and it's continuously synchronized. So what else is wrong with this diagram? Well, there isn't only one Git repo. Uh, you may have noticed I did a little bait and switch there before the app, uh, the Git repo was first called the system and now it's called the app. So let's bring back the system and have a few more apps here since you're doing microservices. I'm sure there's not only one app and let's rename this thing and call it a config repo. Uh, since we might have more than one of them. We also said that Flux uh, monitors the container registry uh, for image update automation. Uh, so we define an image policy, perhaps per environment. And when Flux decides to release an image into the cluster, it does that by writing the update to the system or the config repo. Um, so it should be clear what I meant when I said that Git is our single source of truth uh, based on that and how this approach might differ from other solutions that are push based. So um, going to go through this section pretty quickly uh, because we have seen these before and uh, this is near the end of GitOps days, but here's our cast of characters. The cuttlefish is named after kubectl and uh, the source controller and the customized controller do the main heavy lifting uh, at a glance. Uh, so here's a slightly different picture. Customized controller receives that artifact that's fetched from the source controller as a tarball uh, and the source controller serves it over HTTP. So that's what this part looks like. And Flux's customized controller is used as an applier. We have two options for appliers. The uh, Helm controller is our other option. That also depends on the source controller. So the notification controller has responsibilities mainly related to elevating our situational awareness and ha making things happen faster. Uh, providers handle outbound notifications when the Flux controllers will generate events that you can pick up or filter out through alerts. All of the important nouns in that sentence there are CRDs. Uh, and then what about these guys? Uh, we'll see them in a, in a bit. Uh, and actually we have seen them before. Uh, so if you recognize this is image policy. Okay, so image reflector controller, image automation controller, here they are in the same setting with all of their friends. And let's uh, call this all GitOps toolkit and move on. All right, I'm gonna take the share. Okay. There you go. All right, so for part two, um, what we're going to do is talk about the config reaper pattern and image layer reconciliation. But before we get to that, we kind of need to talk about some requirements. So 
Um, in the enterprise world, when you're doing software delivery, you have hundreds of developers and maybe dozens of teams. Um, you know, these are some of the basic requirements you're probably going to have. Release automation, um, you need a really simple and easy to use pull request process. You need to be able to fix vulnerabilities. Um, you're probably going to have more than one environment. You're probably going to have more than one cluster, and you're definitely going to have more than one pod. Um, and then lastly, you, all of this complicated, complex stuff needs to be easy to consume for those development teams. So for scaling to lots of teams, um, if you go to the Flux documentation, you'll find three patterns. Um, the monorepo pattern, the repo per team pattern, and the repo per app pattern. Uh, these are extremely robust and good patterns. Uh, for example, the monorepo pattern is used by Google today. Um, but depending on the company, you may have different requirements. Um, and in my case, you have hundreds of microservice projects and you need some way to manage all of them in sort of a cohesive, easy to understand manner. Um, so we literally just started talking to Flux um, and kind of came up with a new pattern. And before I move on, um, I think a lot of speakers have mentioned how great this community is. And this entire presentation is because we talked to Flux or talked to people on Slack in the Flux community. So like, it, they're not lying. Uh, it's, it really is a great, great group of people. Um, so moving on, the config repo pattern in the continuous delivery case is expanding kind of on that um, repo per team concept and um, repo per app concept and sort of becoming a hybrid. Um, so at the top level, you have a bootstrap repository. This is probably what you've all seen in multiple sessions today, where you're bootstrapping a repository to a cluster. You have all your flux system type stuff. Um, in our case with this demo, we also have some secrets that are encrypted and, and managed there. Um, and then you have pointers to config repos. Now, these config repos are essentially the central point um, of entry for a, a single application. But that config repo is actually managing the deployment of more than one microservice. So, for example, you might have two teams, and I'm going to actually go to the next slide here. You might have two teams, application team one and application team two. Each one of them is going to have their own config repo. They're both bootstrapped through the same multi-cluster configuration repo, and then they manage all of their microservices um, in separate repositories that are linked to the config repo. So you essentially have three tiers of abstraction. At the highest tier, you have all the really nitty gritty details in the multi-cluster repo. In the configuration repo, we have everything we need to deploy these applications into the different environments. And then at the microservice level, we're following the 12-factor app pattern where there is nothing environment specific or configuration specific stored in those repositories. Um, they are following that pattern uh, correctly. Um, a nice side benefit of this setup is your config repos also represent a bill of materials uh, for each one of your environments because you have an image tag uh, list for all of your microservices deployed inside of each environment. Um, to give you a sort of textual version of what this looks like, and also a fluxified version. Um, at the top level, it's the same thing in the previous diagram. We have a bootstrap repo that is housing two pointers to two Git repositories, both of them config repos. We then, down there in the config repo layer, we have two Git repositories for dev, two pointers for test, and the releases for each. And then lastly, we have two linked microservice repositories that are being listened to by that config repo layer. And those guys have our actual either Helm charts or manifests, but they are not environment specific. The values that those charts and manifests or customized manifests need are passed in by the config repo. So the next problem um, that you have to solve in sort of the enterprise delivery area is you're, if you're shipping that many containers and you're trying to scale Flux, you're probably going to come up to some point where you have uh, the need to patch your images. Um, a lot of companies will use base images from like Docker Hub or Bitnami or whatever, um, but a lot of enterprise companies build their own base images, sometimes called a golden image, um, and then they build their application code on top of that layer. 
Well, most of the third-party tools out there today um, don't support that custom golden image um, layer building process. Um, so, you know, they'll probably give you some information on how to keep that guy up to date, but not how to automate um, patching it out there in the wild. I think some part third parties are starting to get there, uh, but it's still a pretty tricky problem to solve. So what I did in sort of my free time and nights and weekends was wrote a Node.js application that uses the Kubernetes client and talks to the Flux API inside of the cluster and listens for that policy that Kingdon talked about and sends image layer updates to our different services and applications. And you'll see a better example of what that looks like. Um, from an architectural perspective, essentially what this means is you, you remember those microservice repos from the um, app config repo diagram, they have a Docker file each inside of each one of those repositories. Well, if it's say a Rust application, you're gonna have a layer that is referencing that Rust-based image. And so what we are essentially doing is running a scanning process on our Docker registry, publishing the secure versions of the layers to the registry. And then we are syncing that to our image repositories whenever we find new ones through the Flux image policy. Putting this all together, we have a scalable, um, multi-team, multi-developer, multi-cluster um, architecture that also helps us facilitate providing um, patching and updates um, into those environments as well as continuous delivery. So uh, we're not gonna click the recorded demo link because I made a, a better demo. So I'm going to pull up a series. We have two demos. The first demo is the config repo pattern. And the second demo is the image layer. For the config repo pattern, I'm going to use a video because the, the CI build part takes too long. We'd be here for a while. Um, so we're going to go through that first. So here we have on the left a, here I'm going to pause for a moment, a microservice repository. And on the right, we are linked to our different clusters. We have two clusters. The top left is our staging cluster. The top right is our production cluster. Um, and on the top left, we are bound to our um, namespace for this microservice in staging. And on the top right, we are bound to the namespace for our microservice in production. On the bottom right, we are bound to, in that's also production cluster, to the namespace for that image updater, which we're going to demo that one after this demo. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play here. We're going to make a small change to our Rust program here. Um, and in this, we're just going to write simple message. This is a um, Discord bot. Um, so instead of saying, hello, we're going to say something like, uh, hello, GitOps days. And we're going to create a pull request um, for this. And um, that pull request is going to be built by GitHub Actions. And then we are also going to actually deploy that pull request as a preview into our staging environment. Um, so here we'll see here, we're going to open up the GitHub action and just see that Rust process building. And um, this process takes about nine or 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to skip to the to the next video here. Um, and you'll just kind of see it keeps going, going, right? So next we have our um, pull request has finished building. And we're going to take a look at our GitOps days PR. We're going to see, OK, our build process finished. And we're going to look at what we changed. We got hello GitOps days. And then on the right there, we can see our new image. And you can see there that image tag, 9F0, whatever. Uh, we're going to go over here and make sure that that's the correct image tag for our preview environment. So if we go back into our, and we can see 9F0. OK, so we've successfully deployed our pull request preview into our staging cluster at this point. We're going to go ahead and merge that pull request. And then we're probably going to trigger a production release after that. Um, so I'm going to slide this well here. Well, actually, so for the re production release, um, a lot of teams follow the um, trunk-based delivery pattern. Um, we're kind of mimicking that here by creating a release tag. Um, so we're going to do release uh, like 018 on this guy, and then that will trigger a release into our production cluster environment after we build from that pull request um, that just got merged. 
So we'll go ahead and publish that. And we'll have to let that build for a minute. So we'll see that that guy is going out there. And uh, while that's building, I've pulled up our Discord chat. And um, I'm going to scoot back here for a minute. And in that, we're going to see a demonstration of um, that chat feature that we just pushed. So the hello get up stays. So on the left, we can see we have loop check. We say hello, get up stays right there. And then the other one, hello, that's from the production environment that hasn't received the new change yet. So we've only made it to the staging one. So the staging bot is saying hello, get up stays. All right, so I'm going to pause here again, and we're going to slide forward. And yeah, here we can kind of see where we updated the code. There's hello, et cetera. And so we have one more video to look at, and that's our production deployment. So if we go here, we have our build just finishing up. And I'll slide this forward a little bit. Do -do. And there's Kingdon's face. <laughs> and uh, all right, I'm going to stop here. So for this one, I wanted to make sure we also showed you the config repo process. So I'm going to, on the left, jump to the config repo, which is that middle tier. And we're going to see where Flux actually updates our production environment. So you can see that we have a push to our deployment file. And that was 16 seconds ago when that was created. So that was when that build finished. And you can see here, Flux has pushed release-018 to our deployment. And on the top right, we don't yet have um, the, uh, the image deployment coming, but it should be there in just a moment. And we'll slide this just, there we go. Okay, so on the right, we could see, okay, there's our new deployment coming in. We still have our old one running. So if we pull up that Discord bot again, and we actually um, do our check right now, we should get three responses the new production one that says, hello, get up stays, and then that old hello, which is that pod that's still terminating. So if we slide forward a little bit further, and once that guy finishes terminating, now we go back to our bot and we do it again, we're only gonna get two responses from our Discord bot. All right, so that concludes that demo. And now we're going to take a look at our image reconciliation. So for this, this we're actually going to do live. What we're going to look at is first a uh, GitHub repo here. So we're going to take a look at our um, microservice guy again. And to trigger this reconciliation process, um, first I want to show you the Docker file. So let's look at that. Here we're going to have a version for our um, for our Docker file, which is going to be um, Rust 1.59. We're going to be updating it to Rust um, 1.61, I think. So here we can see. So we're pretending that that's essentially our insecure version. So I'm going to go over here, and our bot has already been trying to update it. So I'm going to first um, delete our um, pull request that it creates so you can actually see it happen in real time. So we're going to close that pull request, and we're going to go over here and just delete this branch real quick. And then while we're waiting for that to reconcile, if we come over here on the right. Um, you can see I have three image updater sort of jobs. So what this is, is this is a Kubernetes cron job that continuously reconciles and reads our Docker files and finds those insecure image base layers. And it runs a job about every minute or so. Um, that pushes that image base layer out to our microservice. Um, and um, it then triggers a GitHub action inside of that microservice. So if we take a look here, we have a image layer pull request GitHub action. And what this guy does is says, anytime I get a push, and you see down there at the bottom right, we just got a new job trigger. So we should have a pull request in a minute. Every time there's a push to that golden image uh, branch, we're going to go ahead and automatically create a pull request for that layer. So if we go back to the root of our project here, we look at branches. Here we have our new branch, and we should have our new pull request. And there we go. And if we waited 10 more minutes, which we don't have time for, we would see this pull request with our patched image layer um, getting pushed to our staging environment. And um, yeah, 
that's uh that's pretty much it <laughs> cool perfect timing yeah. um thank you for this talk and um it's always fun to see demos um working yeah. you, you have both recorded and live it seems um <laughs> yep. so with that yes we are at time and remind everybody um we'll move over to the slack channel um, where we'll continue to monitor not just now but um, in future dates so if you are watching this recording please feel free to come to our slack channel and ask questions and we'll ping uh, kingdon and brian to um, help answer so thank you so much appreciate thanks it. so much for sharing the stage with me brian no problem thank you see you